Hello, I am Nevin Lieber. This is my first C++ Now, although I have been to BlueCon. And I'm going to talk about the many variants of standard variant and a few other variants along the way. I work at Argon. There's kind of like who sponsors me. So what is a variant? If you, if you haven't figured that out by now this week, right? It's a you know, discriminated union that knows what type it's holding. And this is about all I know about type theory. So you know, it's on this slide, you know, there's product types, there's structs and classes. A generic version that's you know standard tuple, some types, unions, and variant, and maybe someday language variant. And so we in 17 we added three vocabularies to some types, any variant and optional. So any, it's a concrete type, right? It doesn't have any template parameters itself. Discriminated type, it knows what it's holding. It's an open some type, which means the set of things it can hold is unbounded. And, but it has type requirements on what you can actually store inside it in any. Mainly, it's got the CPP 17 copy constructible requirement. Now, internally, it uses type erasure, which means it generates the equivalent of a virtual function for both, for basically for copying and for looking up and for getting things out, even if you never copy the object. A right, standard function has the same problem. Like, a lot of times, you'll want to call, store a callback but you have to make your callback copyable even though you're never going to copy the object that it's sitting in. Now, I don't know if anybody remembers my, I'd be honestly surprised if anybody remember my type erasure talk from like 2010. This is roughly slightly updated for any. Basically, when you call m place, it does make unique of the model, and then it has to generate this clone virtual function. That calls the copy constructor, and again, as I said, it's always generated. So this is a requirement on things that are stored in standard any, and boost any for that matter. And then we also have this here, right? We, so we have a move constructor that's no except cannot throw, you know, cannot throw an exception. And this has a lot of relevant things to variant as well. But you know, there's space and runtime efficiency concerns for any itself, because you know the, the held object may be put on a heap. Even, you know, if there's not enough embedded space, or if it itself has a throwing move constructor, and we'll dive in. But we would really like to have move constructors uh, that are no except true. And the other problem with any is that there's no known, there's no control over the allocation. Um, the original proposal had an allocator, had allocator support, but we don't know how to store a type erased allocator inside a type erased class. And the other problem with any is that it's basically order n to find out what it holds. But right? if, you, if you know it holds one of you know, five types, you have to basically have a bunch of cascading ifs. This is slow. So why do we want no except move construction? David A. Brown's right, you know, founder of this conference, you know, came up a long time ago with the exception safety guarantees. So there's basic, which means you're in variance, you not, you know, are going to hold no matter what, but you don't know what state. If the exception is thrown, you don't know exactly what state your object may be left in, other than the invariants hold. So if you have things like preconditions, you may have to check them. Then there's strong, which basically is transactional kind of semantics. Either the whole operation has succeeded, or it's back in the it's left in the state that just before you started, the exception was thrown. And some operations have to be no throw, so we can build these kinds of things up. And one, one of the reasons we want um, no except move constructors is because of things like vector. Because right? sometimes we want the optimization when we have the strong guarantee. So if you're growing the internal size of a vector, you allocate new space. If you have a throwing move, then you have to copy the elements because otherwise you cannot restore the state of vector. And if, exception, if you're copying and an exception is thrown, you destroy all the, current, the elements you just created and just leave the old space around. If you have non-throwing move, then all you have to do is move the elements from the old space into the new space. I mean, this was um, one of the prime motivating factors for move semantics. And this is a lot less work. And why we need the strong guarantee, well, like for instance, if you want to build swap, if you have a no, if it's non-throwing move constructible or non-throwing move assignable, this swap also is no except, it doesn't throw. 
So we need those operations in order to build things that give you the strong guarantee. Unfortunately, they don't play very well with variant. And this is really the first pipe in the um, standard library where that's painfully obvious. So we have, you know, variant and, you know, template type is the closed sum type because it holds one of n possible types. So because we specify this, which types it can hold, it's very space efficient. I mean, we know basically we have to be at least hold, if you're double buffering, like two times the um, you largest object plus some, like an int for your discriminator. And we can also do runtime efficiency, right? Problem with cascading ifs is that it's order n. We can do with visitation and uh, we can do order one. And there's optional, which is also a template type and a closed sum type, but it holds up to one element. And basically, it's supposed to, it's, the goal was to make it a refinement of variant, although it actually came first in the standardization process. And we'll see how close we got to that. And it's an easier interface. For instance, if you want to access the object and you know it's in there, do you, you just use dereferencing to get it. Marshall. Thank you. Um, another way to look at optional, and this has caused lots of arguments in, in many, many places, is you can look at optional as a container. It holds exactly zero or one elements, as opposed to an, a refinement of variant. And if depending on where you start from, which yes, which point of view you start from, you come up with very different interfaces and very different use patterns. That's very true. Yeah, when we were debating optional, there were like seven different mental models, and that's one of them. I had that same mental model too. And your mental model for it to find what operations you wanted on it. Like for container, you know, we could add begin and end to optional. I would like that. It would be a hard fight in the committee because there's some people who don't believe in that. And there's a committee. I think that's Marshall there. <laughs> Basically, when we take like group pictures, we don't want to take pictures of people's screens, which is why you're usually from the front of the room. So I firmly believe that every committee member wants to make the language better, right? Even if no two of us can agree on what that means. And ultimately, things get down to a consensus of countries, one country, one vote. So basically, you know, you can't always get what you want. It's, it's, this is consensus, so it's what can you live with? You have to decide, when you propose something, you know, what are the salient features that you absolutely care about and what things are you willing to compromise on? And we take this seriously. I mean, we, we joke around a lot, but the details matter. We know that whatever we decide, millions of developers are going to use what we come up with, and they're going to use it as a model for their types. And we also know it's extremely hard to fix things later. It's not impossible. The bar's not impossible, but it's really hard. And it should be, because that's why this language, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword why C++ is successful, is because old code still just works. So when designing variant, I'm, I'm going to focus basically on these five things. There's even more than this, but I already have 130-something slides, so. The never empty guarantee, assignment, comparisons, default construction, and how to access elements. Or element, because it only holds one. And there's various trade-offs based on for space efficiency, runtime efficiency, compile time efficiency, and the usability of it. So never empty. I mean, ideally, variant does have the never empty guarantee. We would really like it to model exactly one of the bound types. But because of basically throwing constructors, what happens if, if we relax that? You know, what does it do to the trade-offs? So assignment, right? Here, I have a variant V1, it holds an A, and I'm going to assign another A to it. I actually have two choices on what I can do. Right, I can either use its, in this case, move, right, I can use it, assignment just as an optimization over basically destroy then construct. But we can always destroy then construct. Now the question then becomes, should we always destroy and construct? And there is a consistency argument to say, yes, we should do that. I don't agree with that one, but it is worth considering. But the more interesting case, is when you're changing types that it holds, and then places similar issues. 
And after you do this, even if an exception is thrown, you actually expect v1 to, you know, to hold something. But if you're um, not double buffering, then you have to first destroy what this holds and then construct something new. And if that construction throws, what state do you leave variant in? And it turned out, I mean, this was basically, this is the fundamental question for how you define your variant. David? <laughs> so um, in that last bullet that you have there, or yeah. the second to last one, do you mean what happens if these copy throws. constructor? Constructing B. Yeah, usually copy or move constructor, yeah. Well, if it's in place, it could be the actual, just the construct, whatever you're constructing it with. I mean, for this particular example, yes, it's, it's well, that one's move, but yeah. It's more general because of, of in place, basically. Yeah. So comparisons, right? Well, there's actually two ways we could do comparisons. Right? We could just compare values, right? So I have a variant with a short and int in it that has a short 3. VI2 has a short, say, has an int 2. If I compare them, you know, I can assert, you know, the comparison is true this way. If I compare alternatives, which is basically which slot it's in first, and then the values, if they're in the same slot, that will, that will flip. Right? And this result's not surprising. I mean, this is kind of like math, right? 2 is less than 3. However, if we're going to go that route, at compile time, this is basically an order n squared problem, because you have to compare you know, short with short, short with int, int with short, and int with int. And then what do you do with types that like, are not normally comparable? Like, say, for instance, int and string. And we really don't like speeding things out if we don't have to. I guess concepts will be next, but yeah, it's, it's still. And another option, you know, so we can either not compile it or we throw an exception when comparing them. You don't really want to throw exceptions in your comparators if you don't have to. And more importantly, comparing values of different types can make great transitivity. So let's say, hey, I have an int and a string. I'm going to define these operators to do lexical comparisons. So I have, you know, 200, the string 30, and 5. So 200 is less than the string 30, lexically, because 2 is less than 3, it's the first character, right? 30 is less than 5, because 3 is less than 5, but unfortunately, you know, 200 is not less than 5. And while the C++ committee, you know, likes to do things, I don't think we can change the fundamentals of math. So this is a surprising result. And then also, even if you say we have a variant of int and int, and we can go into whether or not you'd want that, but if you're just comparing values, those two things are equal, even though the ints are in um, different slots. Which is also surprising, because it basically says what slot it's in is not a salient feature of variant. So we can then, you know, the other way to do it is we can compare alternative, the alternative and values, kind of the representational comparison. But that makes this one surprising, right? Now three is less than two, because short, short on this variant is less than int in this variant. But types only need to be self-comparable. You only need to make short comparable with short and with int. So at compile time, that's an order n kind of thing. So basically, no matter what we do with comparisons, they will be surprising. And some people make the argument, maybe we shouldn't have comparisons because of that. Then we have default construction. You know, should a variant be default constructible? That turns out to be, you know, also a you know, contentious kind of question. And if we do default construct it, what state do we construct it in? And is that state the same as the move from state of a variant? Because it's not at all clear that it should be. It could be if you, you know, if you did, you know, this, this variant equals A, it has a type I, another variant equals standard move of the, other, the first variant. Is, it, is there a move from variant state, or is it the move from A that's storing? And we want to be able to access the element. So do we allow indexing by type? If you have a variant int int, we'd have to allow, uh, or indexing by alternative, we, if you have variant int int, you have to allow indexing by alternative. 
Otherwise, you could just, if the types are unique, you could just do types. And we want a better way than order n to do it. We want order one. So visitation was usually the way to do it. There's some you know, pattern matching will hopefully be better. Well, it should be better. <laughs> hopefully we get it is really what I'm saying. So way back in history, right? Around 2004 is when loose variant showed up. It did have the never empty guarantee. Assignment is interesting. I will go into it. Default constructible, sometimes. It depends on what types it's holding. It does compare alternatives and values. And it does use visitation. So just the normal um, homogeneous assignment just uses um, A's operator equals. And then they, I wasn't really involved with this, but you know, if it's, if it's on Bruce's webpage, basically. So if we really want this to work in the face of exceptions, we provide backup and temporary storage, we mem copy. Let me show you the diagram. So we start with this, right, V1 here. We then mem copy this over here, so we have a copy of the bits. We then construct B in its place. If that works, we mem copy these B bits over here. We copy the A bits back to here, because now we can destroy A, because A might have pointers in it to itself, so we have to actually put it back in the exact same memory location. And then finally, we construct B. Or sorry, we mem copy B from there to there. It's a lot of work. What happens if it fails, right? You want to construct B, B throws. That's OK, just mem copy all the bits back. You have A back, no problems. This is fraught with peril. Like, so Dave Abrams, you know, then goes like, yeah, this is undefined behavior. Although in theory, a language version could like bless this kind of behavior. You know, and basically, yeah, you just can't mem copy things because you're playing with lifetimes. And plus, even if the you know, language solves this problem and says, yes, this is okay to do in this one circumstance for say a language variant, it's still an awful lot of work. It's gonna have, your variant's going to be slow. So then they had an initial solution. They'd say, hey, let's do double storage. And I want to make it very clear, this does completely solve the problem. Now, one of the weird things is that if you do get A of V1, you may get a different address depending on what you call it, which is surprising behavior to some people. And, but the usual thing is, is nobody wants to pay double the space in their objects. <laughs> yeah, you're right. There are people who do. It's easier to reason about. It depends if you want to reason about it. But even people who want double buffering try to think of schemes to avoid it in most, in many, if not most cases. So if you're doing constructive, yes, uh, Mike. Wouldn't the vast majority of cases have all the members have no throwing uh, move constructors and then you could just decide at compile time if it actually needed to be double buffered? Yes, that's, what, that's usually what happens. Well, it's, that's one of the ways it could happen also. If you can, we're gonna get to it. You can get to a default okay, constructive state yeah. as well. <coughs> that's that's uh, no accept constructible, default constructible. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so there's our lots of cases. Well, but there's actually still problems with that. It's gonna turn out. All right, I'll wait. <laughs> And Marshall wants the, ball, the mic back here. Whee! <laughs> so if we do construct and destroy, because we're double buffering, so we have A, you know, we have our V1 has A in there, we construct B in the other space, it succeeds, we destroy A, we're done. If we throw an exception constructing B, eh, okay, so what? We're done, A hasn't changed, so we're fine. But because of the double spacing thing, there's kind of this temporary heat backup method, which does destroy the construct, but if any type is no except default constructible, you see, you see storage, otherwise heat backup. So here's, this is, you know, this is a lot of work, right? We have A, we copy A over to, into the heap. We then destroy the A, the A we have, we construct a B there. If that works, we destroy the A we just copied. 
if constructing this A fails, then we're going to have to try making the B in, inside the heap. If both constructing A and constructing B fails, we're OK, because we haven't actually gotten rid of this A yet. If we go along and constructing B over here fails, then we're going to copy this A back to here and destroy the one in the heap, because we really, Boost is trying really hard to keep the address the same, not change if there's no action. Of course, both of these things can fail, in which case the A, just by doing this, the address has changed, right? The A you thought you had embedded in the object is now the one in the heap. So, like I said, this, this does it. If you're doing that and it throws, and now your A is, you know, it's a different location, that's surprising. But in order to try to mitigate every, you know, doing heap, um, part of default constructability, if the first type is in boost variant is default constructible, then it is default constructible into that type. And if an exception is thrown during one of these operations, it will construct the, reconstruct the type as, as the exception state. And if boost blank is one of the types in the type list, that's the type it actually will prefer. So basically, if we have a no throw default constructible type, right, the normal case is we have A, we destroy what it is, we construct B right in its place. If that fails, we create a boost blank in this example, we basically the first, otherwise the first default, no throw default constructible type. So this is a lot simpler. Now, the other thing about um, boost variant is that element access can be either done by get or you can do it by visit. So if you also want to print, you know, its value be a get, you know, is it a string? Then print out a string. If it's an int, print out an int, etc. But we can also do visitation. And visitation is you need a function object that knows how to process every type. And you basically you apply the visitor, you apply the visitor function to the variant, and then this can be order one. The downside is I mean, it works, and it works like this, right? So I have this print viz. This is really old code, right? So we can't like deduce the return type. Normally, the return type would go there. Double angle brackets is void. Then you apply, and but this is this weird inversion of control, and people generally don't like it. Um, I think I'm gonna go park somewhere in here. <laughs> you mentioned this. You mentioned this yesterday, and yeah, we knew this going into doing variant. That yeah, this is just. It works, it's good, but nobody likes doing it, and it keeps people from using variant. This is a big usability issue. Just comparing the two. So around this time, oh wait, sorry, the real Matt Cobble. He, he wants to get his name back, he's trying. <laughs> <laughs> So we were both working at a latency trading firm, and we were annoyed with boost variant. And because in, in latency high precision trading, we never want double buffering, and we never, ever, ever want to, you know, heat backup. We don't want the heat allocation; that would just kill us on the fast path. So we're almost always adding boost blank to all the types, which means the visitors kind of all have to know about boost blank, even though that has nothing to do with what we're, the, you know, the state. If we have the state machine, this has nothing to do with it. We also wanted assignment to be fairly straightforward. So we came up with, and the other reason we were working on it, we were both trying to learn how const expert works. So it's like, can we do a variant using const expert functions instead of um, type by programming? So this one, ours modeled at most one. It did have an empty state, and that was the default constructible state. And we always did destroy it and construct. Our comparisons were like boost, you know, we did, you know First, the slots of the values, and we had visitation, as well as get. Right? So this is pretty easy. Now, you there's no like, before I had this kind of box of memory here. The destroyed state in here is re is really it's just a state of variant now. So there's, it's not like it has it does have empty memory, but it had it's actually keeping track of that. And if this throws, we're basically back in this empty state. So. You see that basically this picture is pretty close to the, let's see if I can find it. Right, it's almost the same as this picture, except there's no type there. 
So the reason it's called DTS variant because it's STD backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, so we were very familiar with the issues involved, and we, you know, I seriously thought about proposing it at that time. And you know, so we went to you know, our management. They said, "Sure, you can open source it. This is not part of our secret sauce. No problem." But I'd also tried to get optional into C++14. It was a painful, contentious. And it actually made it into the working draft, and we pulled it. And I had battle scars. I did not want to go through that because I knew Variant was going to be. I believed Variant was going to have that same exact problem on the committee. And the, the two things the committee kept doing is they kept revisiting old arguments without new information. Like this would happen. Like you'd have the first session in the morning, you come to resolution, you go on break. You have the second session in the morning, and the same arguments would come right back. This got awfully frustrating. This was, we were doing most of this in um, Bristol. I think it was Tuesday night, we had a session from 7.30 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. with no breaks, trying to iron out the issues. And we got stuck in comparison operators. You know, this is a wrapping class, so should operator less go to standard less? Should operator greater go to standard less? We couldn't come to that resolution. We tried. So basically, at the Urbana meeting, there's Axel. He did the first modern variant proposal. I believe there were variant proposals long before this, but I don't know. I haven't, didn't actually do the research. He works at CERN. This is back when we had end paper numbers for most papers. And he was targeting the library fundamentals um, type of specification, not targeting the standard because he figured, you know, let's get some you know, time understanding it. So his first version of variant has an empty state. So he always does a sign that um, destroy then construct. Even for homogeneous assignment, which is why I brought that up before. Like this, this was, he was going for consistency. So he was not going to use, you know, the built-in operator, built-in assignment operator of a type. He wanted value comparison. He at that time believed that was the way to go. That was the least surprising route. He felt constructible into the empty state. And he only had get. He did not have visitation. And so we discussed this in, in library evolution, 17 of us. And we you know said, well, there's an alternative to the empty state. You know, if we just constrain the types we allow in variant for the reason you mentioned, then the problem you know, could go away. And one person mentioned, you know, I'm terrified of a world where everyone will invent their own visitor. Well, that wasn't me. I am also terrified of a world where everyone will invent their own visitor. But nobody had a better alternative. And the other problem that came up with comparison of values is, again, it's the full matrix of comparisons. That's where this came up. Because even if he kind of thought it should work, we hadn't at that point yet like thought about the transitivity problem. So the reason Axel didn't do visitation is he talked to Bjarna, who believes that visitation is unpleasant, and we'll have lots of requests for extending it, and so we should just use pattern matching. But that's a language feature, and it wasn't being proposed, and it certainly wasn't being proposed for library fundamentals. So they, you know, they came to the, we shouldn't hold up variant just for pattern matching. And Axel agreed, you know, at that point, he's going to trim visitation down to the bare minimum he could get away with to get the proposal through the committee. However, so now that, you know, this variant's in some ways, you know, close to the way I was thinking of variant and a few other people. But all Axel, the problem with Axel's proposal is that he only proposed, he said variant should work this way without saying the other alternative. The committee doesn't like to just jump to conclusions. They want to see the design space. You should, still, you know, if you're designing, you're having your own paper, you should still say what you want. But you have to, you know, say here are the alternatives. Here's why I consider them, and here's why they are inferior. And of course, there's kind of a running joke on the committee. We take straw polls. Do we want the author to do more work? Yeah. If we say if we say no, we really mean no, but we very rarely say no. We're trying to get better at this. I mean, we. Like bug shedding, we notice we do this, we just don't know how to stop ourselves. So we want Axel to look at a tuple-like interface, you know, making a const expert. What about the never empty guarantee? Should we allow variant int int? Should we allow variant int constant? Those kinds of things. And he has to go do visitation. He can't avoid it. 
about that time, um, I actually asked if I wanted to be a co-author on it, and I said, not after optional, no way in hell, but I want to do as much work as he wants behind the scenes to help get this through, because I really want this in the standard library. So version two, next paper is Pudu Nekla. And the you know, assignment now actually, if it's homogeneous, uses the internal, the types assignment operator, not destroy the construct. And I believe if it doesn't have that, you don't get an assignment operator. If all the types don't have that, you don't get the, the assignment operator. So he did explore alternatives to the empty state. At that point, still like thinking about only copy constructible kinds of things. And that leaves out all types of do allocation. You know, things like vector and string. So they're certainly not, you know, in the case memory, you can throw an exception. You know, explore double buffering. Although for money committee members, that's pretty much a non-starter. And remember, we need consensus. So we need the vast, you know, at least two thirds, we want an even stronger majority of people to agree with the design or it's not gonna go on the standard. He then grudgingly gave into uh, construct um, comparisons by alternates of values, though, because it's transitivity. He really liked to, you know, find some way to do it, but yeah, he's very reasonable. And then the committee woke up to this proposal. Literally hundreds of emails. I mean, and, and not like two hundred, like like eight, nine hundred emails. I've tried counting them, but the, the subject lines keep changing, so it's just hard to count them in Gmail. <laughs> Many of those emails were mine, so I'm part of the problem, you might say. And this was a heated, contentious technical discussion. When people ask us why we don't make the reflectors public, it's really this reason. It's so we can have these heated discussions without, you know, it's not about personalities. These are technical things, and we want to keep them technical. And we want everyone to be free to say what their ideas are. So, you know, you can join the committee if you want to find out. <laughs> and we had lots of suggestions for literally everything about variant you can think of. So comparison suggestions, like, Short is comparable with n, so variant short int should not be comparable with itself because that could be surprising. Again, right, you know, if you have a short two and an int two, those are not equal, that's surprising to some people. And it's, you know, order n squared at compile time. So another way to do it, you know, one of the assignment suggestions is that we say, if it's no except move constructible, right, we can construct a temporary copy of what we're, we've, we construct this somewhere else, and then we move it into place. Even if you're doing end place, you can do the same thing. And then someone said, well, no, no, never empty is really, really important. We want never empty, otherwise it's not a sum type. And this discussion is going on, and then our friend Sean Perrin, you know, chimes in. And he's going like, you know, well, instead of an empty state, what about a partially formed state? where you know, only assignment to it, not even from it, and destruction are allowed. Those are like the bare minimum you need. And you can't even query what the state is. And default construction, importantly, is not the state either. It's just this, the bare minimum that you get into the state. And his claim is that this is still a sum type. You can argue over that, Pidu, and we did. <laughs> and by not requiring the no except move operations, right? Providing the basic exception guarantee becomes complicated. That's, that's just, he, he points out, everybody else is pointing out, this is the, this is the fundamental problem. And the basic exception guarantee requirement usually move from and default constructible are the same state. That just, that's what happens. But this, what he was proposing is really the minimum we had to satisfy. He was fine with more functionality, and he didn't object to there being, you know, the state being queryable. It's just, you didn't need that, as a bare minimum, you did not need that. And I have to learn all this, because I ended up, since Sean didn't go to that meeting, doesn't normally go to meetings, you know, I always had to present his point of view, so. Another suggestion, hey, exception happens, we're done, program terminates. The big problem with this is the user can't check ahead of time that this is going to happen. You know, so if I do, you know, writing good code, you suddenly, ah, you're done. Another suggestion, okay, let's limit the types that are no except move constructible, right? 
Um, this is kind of draconian. It eliminates most legacy pre C++ 11 types and aggregates of them. And it's not portable, it turns out. So list move constructor is not required to be no except. Microsoft's implementation is not no except. They um, allocate um, two, seven, or two, is it two, one or two. And the worst, types that aggregate lists that have as a member also are not no except. And the bigger problem with that is there are no visual cues to that. If I have this type alpha, it has three members, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. Is that no except move constructible or not? I have to basically look inside each of these classes and probably recursively figure that out. So that makes that, that determination is expert only. See, we went through a lot of different ideas. So, okay, so let's get even more draconian. That's it, no, you know, you can't throw from move constructor, period. Let's change the language. Before my time, but it had been tried before a couple of times, and it literally failed every time. Okay, hey, let's make it a language variant, which is nice, but that doesn't actually solve this problem. You still have to think about what should happen here. <laughs> Another thing, okay, let's add a strong assigned member function, which might do what assignment does, but won't throw. Yeah, we could add that, but let's be real. People are just gonna use assignment anyway. No one's gonna go through this much work for their types. <clears throat> Another suggestion, hey, okay, you throw an exception, you be, what the heck, let's not, let's not think about this. <laughs> to me, that's as bad as termination, because again, users have no way to avoid this state. Oh, hmm, we can't really decide. Okay, let's do multiple kinds, and maybe even a framework of variants. And how do people, how do you know, mere mortal developers, which is usually me, you know, choose between them, and do we allow interoperability between them? You know, these now become hard questions. So roughly, we were kind of like these are kind of the four that people narrowed in on. You know, either we do double buffering, we have some kind of empty state, we restrict the types, or terminate undefined behavior. And I kept repeating, that this is what, you know, people would say, I don't like double buffering. It's like, okay, what do you want? And it's really hard to get people to commit. Because, again, it's, it's a bunch of really smart people, right? We can reason about it if you say, here's how I want, you know, this case to work. It's more than a partially formed state, because, you know, you know, spoiler alert, you know, we're going to get there. But. So we can only destroy or assign to it. You can't, we couldn't query, initially query it. And this is actually somewhat problematic. Um, Alistair, I think it was Jacksonville, is the one who really hammered in why this is a problem. Because what it does, it adds an unexpected hidden precondition on copying and moving. Right? You have a a vector of variance with one element. I you know, I want to reserve more space, right? This will internally move. If we're saying there's a precondition on moving and copying, I've now either invoked out of my behavior or thrown an exception or whatever you want to deal with. This is really bad. And as a sidebar, we're still trying to teach the committee that this is, I believe, sorry, I believe this is really bad. Because um, there's also a few proposals floating around to change containers to uh, um, make them value initialized. Well, right now, sorry, right now they're value initialized. Sorry, zero initialized, and we don't want that because if you're allocating, say, you know, a megabyte buffer, you don't want to zero it out if you're about to read data into it. I mean, there's a, you know, it's a very legitimate use case. But this again suffers exactly the same problem. Depending on like, if I have floats here, and I read, it's going to, you know, copy. It may just copy, you know, this little extra memory, right? This one float that has, I've not actually done anything with its bit pattern. If that's signaling NAN, oops, shouldn't have done that. And I'm on a bunch of lists. There's one of C and C++ list about dangling pointers. And it turns out it has the same issue too. If you copy a pointer once, that, once it's freed, you're not actually allowed to do that. And uh, Paul McKinney pointed out this is in C++ fix and Marshall. <laughs> no, no, I don't. it's in weak pointer, right? 
if the object's no longer there, it's got a dangling pointer in it that never gets dereferenced. Right? You know, the code's good in that respect, but it, it, it can be, someone's copying the weak pointer, it can be copied. And these are experts, you know, writing this code. And I don't mean experts in clothes, I mean real experts. This stuff is hard to get right. So we had, we're going to have a discussion in Lenexa. And, you know, we go, you know, we say, hey, everyone who wants to talk about this, let's get to, you know, come to LEWG and we're going to talk about this. And I think Herb Sutter was the only person who said, well, I really want to, but I can't make it. But most people couldn't make it. Again, we're very busy at committee meetings. We have lots to do. So after optional, I said, hey, let's have an evening session on this. I couldn't convince um, the chair of LEWG at the time to have an evening session. He didn't think we need one. So of course, never enough time to do it right. Always time to do it over. You know where this is going, right? But we had a goal in, in um, meeting. We're gonna answer all the open questions. So we had a really small subgroup. There were seven of us in it. It was relaxed, not contentious, probably one of the most relaxed library evolution sessions I've been in, even more relaxing than library working group sessions of Marshalls. Really, it was, it was nice. You know, emptiness versus non-emptiness. You know, how does the assignment between heterogeneous variants, if I have a variant of short int and a variant in short, should that work? Can you repeat types in the type list? Even if you can't repeat types, what about constant volatile qualifications on them? Do we allow references? Do we allow void? Et cetera, et cetera. And we took a lot of polls. So we could go to the main LEWG discussion. So the way LEWG worked at that time is there were little study, you formed little study groups and you to try to get through the papers. And then you go, the little study group figures out the issues and then presents it to the bigger room where we actually vote on them. So the way polls work, there's two kinds. The first one is, you know, are you strongly in favor, favor, neutral against, or strongly against something? Everyone in the room gets a vote on it, and that's the direction we go in. So, you know, should we be able to query the empty state at that point? Yeah, sure, we should. Why not? Do we default construct in it? That's not consent. We kind of want two to one for like those two over those two. We want strong consensus because just weak consensus is kind of this fuzzy thing and we don't really know what it means. And a couple of us, we keep asking this question, no one answers us. So. Do we want to default construct in the first alternative? Yeah, eight to four. It's consensus, it's not quite strong, but yeah, we should do that. We break for lunch, what well, heterogeneous you assignment? And the problem with this again, we have order n squared at compile time. And then someone goes, hey, what if we could sort all the types? Yeah, I was pretty sure you couldn't do that. I hate to say I'm 100% sure of something, because then I'm usually wrong. But I was 99% sure, because there's no total ordering, because of things like dynamic libraries. So I decided I was going to go ask the core working group, I think during breakfast the next morning about this. And if you have preference, please don't laugh at me. So yeah, you watch them cringe. But yeah, there is no total ordering of types in the system. There's still other things we could possibly do, but we didn't go that route. And we went back to the, like, the day before. So should we remove heterogeneous assignment? Yeah, let's get rid of it. Should we allow conversions? Right? This is kind of a usability thing. Right? If you have variant int and string, and you say, hey, this is a constcare array, which will decay to a constcare pointer, but you want to allow that because it's only assignable to that. Otherwise, you've got to wrap this in standard string every time, and that's painful. There are compile time, you know, this doesn't increase compile time, but we believed it was worth it. Should we allow heterogeneous comparisons? Right, a variant int of one and one? Nah. What about int and int? And there's some people who wanted it, like there's some parsing problems. They like having ints in different slots. You might have type depths that have different things. From an implementation point of view, none of us saw this as like, you know, a burden, and if it gets a stronger consensus, sure, why not? So the other kind of polling is we just kind of take like, you know, how many people in the room want this kind of thing? So we're kind of modeling this joint union, so this is fine. But we're gonna order the sequence of types. And if, it, you know, so if we have equal types, should we, you know, vary an indent and we assign number five, should we pick the first slot or don't pick any slots? Or a random slot, right? I mean, I know we all, 
I think we ultimately said, we didn't really pull it, we just said, yeah, we shouldn't just pick either by type. We, we can't say that, you know, this one is better than this. So we're gonna, if you have a variant in DIN, you have to use with the, the, you know, by alternative to put it in there and get it out. Although visitation can see that what type it is and it's fine with that. Should we allow into constant? Sure, why not? Is this valid? Is this, you know, are you allowed to instantiate? You cannot construct this because it has no members, but is it a valid type? Why not? I mean, for generic code, you want these things, kind of things to work. It's just kind of the base case. Like I said, this went on a long time, right? Should we allow reference types in here? Again, sure, right? We're trying to get consensus, so unless we feel it's a really bad feature, we were just kind of saying yes to almost everything, right? But note, optional does not support reference types, and still at this point does not support reference types. And then, you know, void being an incomplete type, sure, let's allow it to. No reason not to. You know, do we have multi-visitation? Sure, we can visit multiple variants. How do we figure out the return type of visitor? Do we use common type? Turns out common type is order dependent. The same return type. We, we don't want to be able to specify it because we want to use things like lambdas. And you can't inject the return type into the lambda. You have to deduce it like from the outside. You can't inject types inside a lambda that you can query. And so also, you know, return it. Distinct, otherwise, single return type, lot, lots of holes. Do we want a pointer version of get? So if you look at boost any or standard any or dynamic cast, you can, if you do a get on the address of it, you get a version that doesn't throw. If you're asking for a reference back, it's got to give you the reference, or if it's not there, it has to throw. We all wanted that. So again, we came back, should we default construct in the empty state? And now we're kind of saying, no, we shouldn't. So should we default construct in the first type? Yeah, that's like, that's something we can teach, right? The, the, one of the problems with the boost one is that it's fairly complicated. Like, if this magic type's in here, we'll use that first. Let's just use the first type. If it's not there, you're out. You can't default construct. You're out of luck. So what's an index return if we're in this partially formed state? Should we be allowed to call, even call it, right? And so there's this kind of precondition, like on visitation and get, you can't actually call those functions at this point if you're in the state, in the, what will become the valueless by exception state. Do we want type lists? The answer was no, because we actually really do want type lists and you know, metal programming around it, but it's a more general problem. And so it's now kind of morphing into compile time programming as part of reflection. And the other thing um, Axel initially wanted, he wanted access to the data buffer, like a dot data call. And it's like, no, that you're just trying to, you shouldn't be looking at the bytes. So Axel kind of like squirrels away for the rest of the week. So we can, we want to get this out here while we have consensus. We don't want to like wait another meeting because all these arguments will start over again if we do that. So he has an empty state. He goes off in a corner, starts writing this, you know, occasionally bring him food, don't want him to starve. So there's an empty state, but only when assignment fails. Assignment uses, you know, the same, if it's homogeneous, uses the, the built-in operator. If you fail at changing types, you're in the empty state. He was kind of missing this line. Comparisons only work for variants of the same type. We do no longer allow heterogeneous variants to be compared. And basically what we've talked about. We spent a lot of this meeting, you know, trying to get this done. We want to get this out. There's still one person who wants to default construct the empty state that nobody else wanted, and Alistair, finally, I think, finally convinced him that was a bad idea. And we want a separate way to query this state, right? Right now, we just kind of index which slot it's in, negative one, but sure, why not, right? And so if it's, a val if it's valid, basically not in the empty state, return a magic value, it's weak consensus, not really. Is there any have you know, saying which slot it's in, a precondition of being valid. Not, you know, what, seven to six, that's not consensus. So the paper need not change. So there's new paper in the postal next to mailing. And basically, you know, the empty state when assignment fails and visit has a variadic signature, so you can visit multiple variants. 
Version 4, yeah, um, Excel out of this, you know, okay, if I know I have a no-throw move constructor, and I'm like doing things like that place, I can construct over here, if that succeeds, and I just move construct it into place, and if that fails, I haven't destroyed my old object yet. So that's, it's actually, you know, that works well. But to me, we're adding a pessimization in this case. And it's kind of like we're trying to reduce, you know, Sometimes it will totally eliminate the problem of an exception happening, and I think that's okay. At this time, we're trying to, you know, what if we're trying to reduce the chance of an exception? And to me, if you, they don't happen that often anyway, and if I have to write code to deal with an exception, I don't want to just reduce it. I don't want that pessimization. I don't want to pay that price. Now, you know, of course, don't just believe me because I say it's a pessimization. You know, you should measure. I should measure. I did not measure for this talk. I suspect, you know, doing this double, you know, time kind of thing, this is not good, but I believe this is a pessimization. Now, remember how I said, like, we didn't have an evening session, right? Then he woke up again. At my best count so far is that there were 1,080 email messages in this set of them. That's a lot of email to go through. It's hard to get any actual other work done at the same time. I, I, it's one of the few times I've had to like turn off email until I got home that evening, like for a week. And many of the you know the people who couldn't make it to the meeting, you know, you know who were at you know at Lenexa said that's when they chimed up. This is a little frustrating because we really wanted to hammer it out. And I have to keep saying this, but you know. All the same arguments came again, just like with optional. And this, to me, this frustrated me. You know, I kept saying, this is not new information. You know, there were a few things that, you know, people would bring, bring up new information. Peter Dumas brought up some new stuff. But generally, in those email threads, they were exactly the same as the last time. Well, except for the crazy stuff. So we, apparently, you know, 17 people was too small. We need more cooks to make a better variant. Make it so the folks at C++ now like it. No, I wasn't here, I think it was 2015. What did you guys want? Anyone? So it was represented to the committee that what you, you didn't want, I'm throwing moves. Um, head of one of the national bodies, you said, don't even think about putting this into a standard before putting it into TS. It's like, because it's so contentious, we got to just, you know, we got to spend a lot of time thinking about this. Another thing, make it so you can't change the active type. Basically. Once a variant has a value, it has that value forever. If you want to change it, use an optional variant. Or, hey, you know, we can get if we just make variant move only, maybe that'll solve the problem. And there's a subgroup working on transactional memory. Let's just use transactional memory for the variant to fix the problem. But like I said, I, you know, like or hate what we did, we did think about this a lot. So version 5 comes out. We've now moved to the P numbering system for papers, basically to keep, so you can see what revision a paper's on. And there's some ISO rules why we'd rather have it unofficially published than officially published. Invalid is now a visible state for get and visit, and it's no longer a precondition for copying or moving. But Axel, you know, there were some competing papers at that point. Axel did another one. I don't believe his heart was in it. This is basically the slightly refined version of his first variant, default construction of the empty state, assignments always copy, destroy, then no comparisons in it. I think it's mainly because we asked him to do this particular work. And then our friend Mike, Michael Park had a proposal, you know, proposal, talked about it, and there were some kind of interesting things like type switch. If you want to learn more about that, well, if you're here, build a time machine and go to his talk. If you're on the video, watch his talk. It's, it's great. And this is really, you know, the stuff in there is going into pattern matching, and that's really good. And I think that's the right place for this stuff, instead of just a library. And of course, David Sanko, he just kind of like, he had a couple of short papers, like, you know, what about just a simple variant, basic exception guarantee, no buffering unless one's no except default destructible. Yet another paper, a strong variant, never empty and double buffering. But his most interesting paper was the case for a language-based variant. And it is a one-liner, again, 
same, same thing about you know, his talk. You know, if you're here, build a time machine and see it. If you're on the video, go watch his video. It's also a great talk. But the big thing, you know, alternatives have names, like unions do. And, you know, tuple doesn't, and variant doesn't have names for things. But, you know, the name is, you know, get type. That's a horrible thing to call. And the really interesting idea is pattern matching. And at that time, it was kind of a s switch and um, case based on the type. This is being evolved again. This is my one minute saying, we want this. I'm really hoping this is a flagship flagship feature of C++23. I mean, this fixes the usability problem of variant. They had, I wasn't there, but I heard about it. They had an evening session. And the scribe, although I believe he used more swear words than this, you know, here's repeated arguments, call it up, and stop taking minutes. And he only had to do this once. There were two papers presented, basically Axel's and David's, because there were logistic issues with Michael being there. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> and of course, we encourage David to do more work, because that's what we do. <laughs> but all that had to change, right? This, you know, 2,000 some emails and God knows how many hours, right? Basically, an exception of valid state is never a precondition. That's, that's basically all the change in all this other contentious work that we did. So we had, you know, Kona, they had uh, 19 people in the LAWG discussion. And should you allow conversion, if unique, for both construction and assignment, that's the um, variant in string equals quote, hello, unquote kind of thing, sure. And of course, the other thing the committee loves to do, especially in library evolution, is bike shedding, where it's at the last minute, let's come up with a better name, like in two minutes, because this name will last forever. I'm not a fan of how we do bike shedding. I believe names are extremely important, but I do not believe we do them very well. But so valid became not valueless by exception. Mostly I try to, if he has a feature, I'll live with a bad name. Sometimes I'll fight the name even. So P0088R1 came out, incorporated the Kona changes and had some bug fixes to things he'd gotten not quite right. It's hard writing these papers. R2 comes out, and instead of targeting the TS, let's go for 17. Let's go for it all. Because after the Jacksonville 2016 discussion, where we discussed V6, you know, can we gather, it will be the last meeting before, that basically, if we say yes there, we can get it in. If we say no there, it's not going in 17. And the general feeling was, we have consensus. Ship it. Get it out there. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to read these quotes because I think they're very important from R2. To, this is making the case for 17. Remember now, there was a national body who had previously said, you know, over my national body, this is going to go into 17. We don't say over our dead body because we don't want someone to try that, but over our national bodies, okay. <laughs> so C++ 17 needs a type safe union. Let's not make the same mistake we made with optional by putting this library into a TS. We waited three years where no substantial feedback or discussion occurred and moved it into the IS virtually unchanged. Meanwhile, the C++ community suffered, and we continue to suffer from lack of this essential vocabulary type and interfaces. The implications of the consensus variant design are well understood and have been explored over several LEWG discussions. Over a thousand emails, a joint LEWG-EWG, that's evolution group, session, and not to mention 12 years of experience with Boost and other libraries. The last major change made to the proposal was non-breaking and added exception throws, where previously there was undefined behavior since then, all suggested modifications have been cosmetic, rehashes of old discussions, or would be handled just as well by defect resolutions. C++ community should not wait three years for widely used library that is already done. It fits its purpose and has such extensive review. There is a low chance that we will regret including variant in C++17, but a high chance we will regret omitting it. Well, I didn't write this stuff. I totally agree with this. More time to argue about it would just be wasting time. We would not. These are trade-offs, right? There's no real correct answer, we're just going to make slight differences. You know, there's nothing, nothing fundamental is going to change by waiting. Peter Dimov is not happy with this, by the way. He really wants the never empty guarantee. So he proposed valueless variants considered harmful, a pill free constructor for types, you know, that are, can throw on move and kind of it's about destructive move kinds of things. The committee keeps trying to put destructive move into it. We'll see if that ever happens. Destructive move is kind of like 
an even weaker set of invariants than what move normally. Move normally keeps your class invariant. Destructive move is a slightly weaker set that lets you allow to destroy the object, but you can't do anything else with it, including assign to it. So R3 comes out, more bug fixes, in the final plenary session at ULU. And one of the national bodies said, if you want variant, if you, if you want any, you need variant as well. Otherwise, people are going to use any. You know, this making the case for this. And you know, movie applied to the C plus plus working paper, the proposed wording from P0088 R3, variant, type safe union for C plus 17. It passed. We got variant. I still have a few more slides, but <laughs> so then came like kind of like national body comments. So okay, we got rid of you know things we were kind of saying, sure, let's get consensus, we'll put them in. Sure, let's throw them out to get this actually in 17. So we got rid of references, incomplete types, got rid of arrays, because optional doesn't support references. We want those to be the same thing. Um, we can't use incomplete types because very, very need to know the size. We didn't actually say that before. And just arrays are weird. They don't really work that well with these kinds of things. And I've never gotten an answer why this got thrown out, but you can't even, you know, even though you can't instant, you know, you can't even say this type. This type is invalid. I mean, I mean this is paper 0510. There's like no reasons why this is, but again, it's this gets it out the door, and that's a minor. So this is kind of a summary. We haven't actually changed. It's pretty much we're done with the library-based version of variant. So. Way back, you know, 100 slides ago, I said, you know, is optional refinement of, you know, variant of null op t and t, right? It should be kind of a superset, but with easier operations because we're more limiting because we allow only one type. Well, no, we didn't get there. Optional, and I think it's good, does not have a value that's by exception state. Basically, it goes in the null op t state if an exception is thrown in one of these weird cases. And there's currently no support for getter visitation, but there's no reason we can't add it. It's just someone would need to propose it and push it through the committee. Marshall, no. <laughs> I, I don't have the fight in me to do this, but I'm, I'm willing to support someone if they want to do this. <laughs> so way back, you asked the question, right? So we have two floats, right? Trivially no except move in copy constructible, right? You know, by the way I'm phrasing this question, you knew the answer was going to be, yeah, this is a problem too. <laughs> it turns out. Augustine figured out, like, he, he, I didn't have enough time to put his variant on the slides too, or I don't think he wanted 200 slides. But if we have the struct here and it's conversion operator throws, we can get into that state. Even though the types themselves don't have this problem. So we do end place over here, we do catch. This end place says, okay, I will destroy the float that it has. I'm going to kind of extract the int. Let me go get the int from this here. That throws. Yeah, we're there. Current implementations don't agree on this. I don't know why. But yeah, but it's, it's really weird, right? Because you have, you know, you think that type cannot get into the state. Good thing we have clever people to figure this out. I believe there were language changes talked about for fixing this problem. I don't know what the status of those are. And then basically go see his talk. But you know, language variant is being proposed. And so Axel and I are sitting in the during the discussion and we're hearing uh, not his fault, not David's fault, it's just all the same arguments keep coming back again because they're still the same trade-offs. They don't go away. And I think at that point you were changing changing inspection, right? Inspect instead of switch. So we discussed it at Kona, and, and because of the language feature, we actually have, it's actually harder. Because now we can have throwing destructors, right? The library has a general ban on, if you have a type with a, with a destructor and it throws, you're on your own. We don't support that case. The language, so far, doesn't get that freedom. So. We have even we still have hard problems we need to solve. And then like, you know, should we how do we can we let you 
get automatic assignment and stuff? Or do we say equals default? And if we let you do equals default for this, should we let you do the, this kind of rewrite thing for classes? And we don't have end place yet. Now, like I said, and, and that's going well. And again, I really do hope it's the C++ 23, one of the flag features from 23. Peter, again, he really wants never empty. And again, this is not unreasonable. I mean, this is certainly, I, I can go, you know, a CY. And so it's kind of like the way boost variant works, just kind of a little more modernized for, you know, move, move things. Yeah, the boost, this is like last couple of weeks was a review, and yeah, there were hundreds of emails again. Same issues all come up again. <laughs> never empty means also that it can never be in a partially formed state. That is correct. Yeah, never empty means it can it never be in a partially formed state. Okay, I think that's the problem. Okay. And again, this is a desirable property. It's just to get the, we. It's it's not that we don't want it. It's that we want to pay the cost to get it. So during this whole variant thing, nobody actually asked me what I wanted in a variant. <laughs> You know, for three, like three years. I mean, this is, you know, usually someone asks me. I, now, I mean, I'll tell you, usually tell me what I'll settle for, but what I want? Well, so my criterion for variant was, if I have to tell people don't use the one in the standard, you'll use the one in boost, then we have failed in standardization and I do not want that in the standard. So that was like, that was my baseline. And I think we came up with something that was really good. It's consensus based, it's not perfect from my point of view and, or probably anyone's point of view, but I certainly use it no, with no problem. I might want to see two other variants. I want a strong performance one, kind of like the one DTS variant. I mean, this is not me just saying, yeah, I did this. I, I've been thinking about this a long time. You know, and maybe a refinement so that it is a refinement of optional, so that they're not that different. You know, always construct a sign directly in the variant. You know, it's an exception. I mean, this maybe comes because I did low latency trading. We don't want to, you know, exceptions almost never happen, and if an exception happens, we just tear things down, we're done trading for that moment. I don't want to ever pay a cost just to either minimize or avoid exceptions. And then I'm, I'm kind of with Peter, and we also need a version that allows you to reason about it. You know, so double buff, and I think that would have to be always double buffering. Because otherwise, you know, figuring out is it doing construct and then destroy, or destroy then construct? What if my constructor of this has a pointer to that other one, it, it, it gets messy to reason about. But yeah, I want something with a strong exception safety guarantee and a never empty guarantee. I'm gonna thank my family for you know, indulging me on this, my various employers for paying me to like, go to standards meetings and to like here, and boost, boost con and C++ now. If you notice on the, you know, in the talk, most of the people referenced are in this community, are active members of this community. You know, we sometimes get, you know, boost is not relevant kinds of things. They're wrong. We are. We're making a difference. You know, this is not low hanging fruit. This is hard stuff. You know, we're the guys who, we are the people, let's say, we are the people who decide, you know, how libraries should work. The committee, I mean, we got it through. It's long and contentious, but again, everybody wanted something good. Um, my reviewers, and especially I want to thank Axel, who, basically putting up with us and championing it. That this was hard. And Axel's comment on me is he thanked me. I hope I brought some sanity to getting variant in the language, or in the library. I am done tuning my own horn, so any questions? <laughs> or is it just Friday we're all tired? <laughs> Okay, very much thank you for the talk. I understand this all way better. <laughs> um, I'm kind of actually warming up to Dimoff's proposal, which is probably not your intent, uh, <laughs> because what I like about it is if it's not double buffered, when I put a default constructor thing, a constructable thing in the front, then I can almost build the functionality that's in the standard library now yes. by putting a throwing type in the front. Um, what am I missing there? <laughs> 
double buffering was really a non-starter for a lot of people, like at, at all to ever allow it, like not even like rarely. Yeah, like my initial but, reaction was very repulsive, but <laughs> you've kind of convinced me of the other. When we tried to start that discussion, it got shot down very quickly. And again, I would rather have a variant in, in the language than not. And so I certainly wasn't going to push that hard on that because that wasn't, I was willing to, you know, give in on that. Stop being so diplomatic. I asked you for your opinion. <laughs> it's not being diplomatic. As, as I, the choice really does become, do I, is this going to get in the language or not? I mean, there were points, you know, during the discussion, there were things Axel didn't like. And he, you know, was not threatening the committee, just basically saying, if we're going in this direction, I will not be pursuing this. Someone else would need to do it. You know, then that is a threat. It's just he meant it. it would not meet his needs. You know, consensus is hard, right? It's not what we want. It's what we're willing to live with. Hopefully we can live with something good. I still think it's good. Okay, thanks. No, no, I, I, and thanks I, for all your work. Right? It's so much easier to reason about the, you know, never empty. Yeah. It, it really is. It's just, is that cost worth paying? Yeah, also, thanks for the, for the talk. Um, I also go with a never empty because, in my sense, it's the only sane mathematical description of a sum type. Um, <laughs> I agree, I, 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 I agree I, with I, that. I, it, is the, it is the only sane definition. Okay, uh, but but C++ is not a language we necessarily we we make compromises for the world, I, right? I expect you thought about adding type traits to variant. <laughs> well, type why did you do it? Type traits tend to lead to ODR violations. Yeah, I think it got discussed too. Because where where so you have a variant of shorted. Where do you put that type trait to say how it should work? Well, shorted it's not. Where do you put it? And then let's say I have a variant of you know x, y, and z, and you have a different variant in your code using the same types of x, y, and z, we better not have two different type traits. So it's, it's a big problem with type traits is customization point. Is that where do you put it so you don't get you know, an ODR violation? So me personally, I gently shy away from customizing type traits for that reason. I recall, I'm a, my name's Jason McGuinness, I'm a member of the British Standards Committee, C++ Standards Committee. I recall the discussions surrounding standard variant <laughs> at the time. Uh, we, also, we did discuss adding, in our panel, adding type traits to it, if I recall correctly. And we decided against it in, in, in our discussions, simply because we found that it reduced consensus. Because one of the things yes. we felt very strongly is, and I'd like to thank you personally, very much for your efforts and Axel's efforts and everyone else are getting standard variant in because of the amount of effort it took. Massive effort. And C++ is better for it. Recall C++ is not a safe language. So therefore, ha not having the never empty guarantee satisfies many more users simply because we look at speed much more. Yeah. We are there to give you the bullets, give you the gun, load the pistol, and <laughs> even point it at your head. Good luck. <laughs> I mean, it shouldn't go off if you don't point it at your head, but yeah. It's <laughs> Do you have? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I've been thinking more about my question since I <laughs> raised my hand, but I, a lot of these differences arise in certain parts of the life cycle of the variant that most algorithms don't need to care about. So I guess the, yes. <laughs> the question is, do we need a concept for variant? So people can do all these things that they want to do and not worry about it. Maybe? <laughs> I'm not sure what that concept would be like in terms of like our normal framework of concepts I think it's because it's not just light right because we want a language version maybe David can, has a better answer for that I don't know or Michael do you have a better answer because I don't I haven't really thought about it so okay thank you very much for the update as usual I'm late for the party <laughs> <laughs> but I have I think a couple of things to say um, I it wasn't clear to me whether the committee agreed what kind of sum type they wanted to model. Mm -hmm. Because I think there are two kinds of sum types. Ordered sum types and unordered sum types. And it's, yes, it's not a secondary question. Because it can answer other questions later. Yes. No, no, we For example, if the, if the sum type is unordered, then the default constructed variant 
should be in a partially formed state because no type is, is right. No, 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 no type is preferred. So it, no it can answer that question whether you're model one or the other. I'm not saying that one is mm -hmm. better than the other, but no, no. That answer those questions. The other thing is that variant without the concept of a covariant function is difficult. Yes. And I, I would say that there are functions now and there are covariant functions. And again, this is not a secondary point because assignment, there are two types of assignment. There is a, a, functional as a function assignment and a covariant function assignment. Yeah, that, that kind of thing. So I, I posted something in Boost channel today in, c in CBB about the covariant <laughs> I didn't library. read it this morning. <laughs> Sorry? It's hard keeping up. I didn't, read, I didn't read those things this morning. OK, no <laughs> worry. worry. <laughs> and we can talk later. Yeah. <laughs> but I think even, even if covariant functions are not adop adopted in the, in, the, in the library, I think thinking about them yes. will answer many questions. And, uh, and, and you are correct. Yeah, we, we actually did think, you know, if we have one where the order doesn't matter, and then, you know, variant short int and variant in short should somehow fundamentally be the same type. We just couldn't figure out an efficient way to make that happen in yeah. the language. Yeah, and it's really yeah. what the overriding concern about yeah. that. Um, so one thing I just wanted to give a, a little bit more color to, like, how this ended up in 17 versus... Um, it I've missed like four meetings, so like al almost all that for me is second hand, so I'll, yeah, please do. Um, so at, at the meeting where we voted it into 17, um, I spoke, I, I really, really wanted it in 17, and I was pushing this really hard. I, I spoke with the chairs of the different groups, and they were like, no way, it's going to go into a TS, there's no way. I tried to get it to even discuss it in LEWG, and it's like, well, there's no paper for it, so we can't discuss it. <laughs> so I got to, a I went to Axel, I'm like, Axel, we got to like do something. So that prose that you put up there, I actually wrote that. That was like <laughs> my one contribution of actual text to that uh, to that thing. And I finally it, twisted. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't pay me to read it up, put it in the slide and read it either. <laughs> I, I, I twisted <laughs> Jeff's arm enough to where we actually discussed it. And lo and behold, we had consensus to put it in the 17. And then the next meeting, uh, there was a big discussion of, you know, could we pass this in plenary? You know, it was such a controversial thing. And at the beginning of the meeting, they always ask, like, hey, who's going to vote against this? And there were some people that raised their hands to vote against it. And we worked to try to get consensus during that meeting. At the end of the meeting, when it finally came up to a vote, whether or not we want variant in 17, it was unanimous consent. So it was like the most divisive thing ever. And then we got unanimous consent in the end. It was totally cool. Thank, thank you. Seriously, that, this is a huge accomplishment. <laughs> Any, any more questions? <laughs> the, the other York Brown. So you can do std variant with just one type, right? Yes. And I'm trying to understand the things that cause the valueless by exception thing. Um, and my question is, what's the difference between whatever action would cause the valueless by exception state for variant with only this one type, and if it's one the same type, I don't operation see happening to an actual variable of exactly that type. So no. if it's just one type, I don't believe you can get into that state because let's say your variant of int, right? It starts out having an int, and even if like construction fails somewhere, well, uh, sorry, m place can get you in there because m place still requires you to just doesn't use assignment, right? If you use assignment, you can't get there because. It's, the assignment throws in your whatever the you know move from state is of the type it's holding. But if you use mplace, you have to destroy what's in there first and then construct. Because you don't know because in general you don't know which construct you know which constructor is going to be called. So mplace you, you always does construction do and never So that assignment. can still get it to that state. Okay. It's a great question though. Actually all the questions would be great. Great. Mm -hmm. Um so there is some overhead associated with um, valueless by exception in visit. At least in uh, libc++, there is a check at the beginning where it looks at all the past variants and throws because it has to throw. Yeah. Um, and is there a reason why you couldn't say that if all of the types are no except move constructible, that this overhead isn't present? It, well, this problem. Uh, <laughs> Floated in are, are no except move constructible. It still gets in that state. 
Okay, I have to stare at it. <laughs> so, so basically, this, this has a float, and you want to you want to change it to an int. Uh -huh. So you destroy the float. Now I'm going to construct the int. Let me go fetch the int from the conversion operator. Oh, that conversion operator throws. Ah, it's what state operator do I leave it in? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. By the way, it's, it, even when you know Augustine first, you know, percent, I didn't believe this, right? I just like, nah, this, you guys don't know. It's like, you know, then he very patiently explained this. It's like, oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this this stuff is hard. It's you know, and there's lots of really weird corner cases we keep finding for, the, for everything, and we do. which is a good reason to put it in the standard library as opposed to having everybody do their own because there's lots of weird corner cases. And, and doing your own generally requires you to be a language expert. It's, it's how do you make a context for, you know, is recursive union going to work? You're doing type hunting. There's a lot of, it's hard. And I'm sure, you know, implementers will tell me it's, it's very hard as well. I let Michael do it for <laughs> Just to uh, respond to your concern, I, it seems like we might actually be able to remove the check ahead of time uh, in the switch-based implementation because we can check for the values by exception case inside the switch uh, rather than doing a separate check. So I think we might be able to get rid of it. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing, uh, so the question that I have for you, Nevin, is what do you think about the, I mean, it seems like the thousand emails could have been avoided if we kind of like, collected the running ideas as we went to tell people like, look here, these are the running ideas. If it's already been discussed, then go away, right? <laughs> I would um, hope that. I don't, I don't know that the committee would respond. We would have to write a paper and the paper has to get out there and most people don't read the papers until the actual mailing, the actual pre-meeting mailings. It's, it's how do you get people to do that, right? Yeah. I, I wish, because again, this is what kept me from putting my name on the variant paper uh -huh. because of we went through exactly the same thing with optional, and maybe I'll someday do a presentation on that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'm, so yeah, yeah I'm basically I, asking about. We, I think we should try it to see if we can. If next time we think there's something this contentious, to yeah. you know, here's all the things we've discussed so far. Yeah, I'm mainly just asking about the standardization process and like how to improve it because it seems like in this particular case, a lot of emails could have been avoided, maybe, um, and the other is like. Maybe there should have been some kind of throttling. Yes. Because it seems like we got to. Like, I think we got the throttling in Kona when, when the scribe said, you know, if you, if you repeat information, oh, yeah, we have. That's true. Yeah. But it's I don't like, know how we do that in an email. Yeah. Cause, it cause almost seems like you got to consensus by exhaustion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure some people just said, yeah, I put it in. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Yeah, like, I'm done with this. Get it out there. I don't care, kind of thing. So I don't know. Don't use that as a strategy for putting things in the standard, please. No, no, no. Absolutely not. Anyway. Yeah, no, it's, it's <laughs> I, th I think we need to, it's, it's actually going to get harder because we have more papers now. So it's, it's harder for people to pay attention to things that, they're, that they might care about, but they don't know they need to care about it yet. So I think the problem's just going to get worse before we figure out ways to make it better. Use the wiki. <laughs> have the wiki already. <laughs> yeah, we can't get people to read it. It's, it's, people read, you know, you, sure, you read it. <laughs> Yes. But, uh, what I was going to say is, what we could do is, uh, we talked about, somebody talked about, you know, these, these are the discussions we've already had, you know, summarize those on yes. the wiki, and then in the email discussion say, every time say, we've had these dis this discussion before, please see this. Or yes. <laughs> yeah, the problem is it also has to have links to where those discussions are, because people want to actually read yeah. them. You know, we can't just say conclusions, right? You say... Yeah. It, if you want to argue this, go read this to say, here's what we discussed. Here's how we came to the conclusion. Anyway. And we're all volunteers. So, and, yeah. and, and, you know, I can't, I don't want to tell you how many hours it took me to do this presentation, right? You know, trying to summarize three years worth of work. <laughs> so if people want to volunteer to do that, sure. <laughs> yeah. if, all right, incoming. We, we will vote for you to do more work. No problem. No. So, the <laughs> other, so the other question I had is actually, um, the, some of the last minute, like, name changes. Um, so like you mentioned the get API, right? Yes. And the pointer version. So that last minute was renamed from get to get if. Yeah. <laughs> which like in and of itself I'm okay with, but it's kind of unfortunate that get if still takes a pointer because the whole point of it was Yeah, if you're, if you're changing the name, you don't need 
right? So it, it takes a pointer. Like it's, any cast is, is really weird, right? Because you can pass it the any object, and it does reference returns reference or throws. And if you turn it a pointer, if you pass it a pointer, it returns right. pointer, which is weird, right? Because you're kind of conflating those two things together. Yeah. So if you change the name, you don't have to conflate those. And, and you're, <laughs> I wasn't there for when they renamed that, yeah. but yeah. yeah. If you're gonna rename it, then yeah, it should just take the take the object right. by reference. And by the way, I, d I do have some ideas on how we can make bike shedding better. I think, me personally, I think when we're naming things, they need to be in papers as well, so we have time to think about them. We shouldn't be renaming things at the last moment because the names last forever. So those two name changes that were done last minute were Tony Van Erd, um, and he had <laughs> really good reasons for them. Uh, the get if, he, he changed it from get to get if because get is fundamentally a different kind of operation. Like the semantics are fundamentally different and calling it the same thing is, is not right. And then the value list by exception versus empty or whatever we had it before Valid, is because if you are using that function, you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah. So the idea of calling it value list by exception, it's scary enough that if you see somebody using it in code, then you have like a little flag like, wait, there's something might be going wrong here. So it, I actually it, like both of those changes. And it turns out if you're in that state, you may not be able to get out of that state because, oh, I have my exception handler, I'm checking, let me sign in something new back at throw again too. It's, you could be stuck there. Um, quick question. Regar sure. Regarding uh, ordered some types or ordered yes. bytes, uh, there was any discussion on making variant blah, 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 not really a type but an alias for something else? Yes, like if, if we could sort the types, yeah, we would make well, that way, but there, would, there would be some other fundamental yeah. underlying thing that it would be. But in some sense, MPL does that, and I'm sure MP11, because they tell you never build a set with the types. You have to make set or something which generates a type for you, and that is, I guess, is not order, but it will be accessed in some other way always, which is what matters. So there is a lot of technology that was in MPL and probably in MP11. And, and a lot of it depends on how expensive is that technology yeah, yeah. around. No, I agree, it's I agree. It's but, it's you know, design decisions. For sure, no, no. It's, it's, yeah. I don't know how much in depth, I'm trying to remember how much in depth we discussed that kind of thing. We did discuss it, but I don't know if we came to, the, join the committee. <laughs> <laughs> I believe uh, make set in MP11 only guarantees uh, unique types, but uh, you can't sort types. like without a predicate, right? And you don't have a predicate because there's no total ordering of types. There is like a hack where you can do in GCC, like make a like pretty printed function and then evaluate that as a const expert string and then do some kind of sorting based on that, but it's a total hack and it's, uh, yeah. We have less than two minutes, any more questions? Thank you very much. I, I hope we, you know, like or hate what we did, you know, we tried hard.